All right, guys, how's it going? A couple of years ago, I was contacted by two really cool guys from a company who wanted to do some popular piece explaining the path tracing technology used in their project. The end result of our collaboration was Beyond Turing, which I am delighted to say was very popular and is by far and away my most watched video. After that, we kept contact casually and due to some recent progress of their project, we decided it was a good time for another collaboration, but this time going deeper than just the fundamentals of path tracing. In order to fully grasp the technology and reasons behind their project, I will have to go over a history of different technologies. So let me just start at the beginning. I didn't go to university immediately after leaving school. I instead joined a computer training program down in air in the west coast of Scotland. And through that, I got my first job as a programmer. This would have been around 1991, 92. I was 16 years old. And during the training, I was made aware of something called a BBS, or Bulletin Board System. And this was just incredible for me. Basically, a bunch of people online, before online was even a word, talking about computer stuff, and to be frank, we were trading pirated games, which was one major reason for their growing popularity. So this was obviously before the internet took off, which happened around the middle of the 90s. And my love of being online meant I used to rack up some extremely large phone bills due to what was essentially an addiction for information. It was 1995 when I finally went to uni. And as we were all sitting a computing degree, we all knew about the wonders of the internet long before the normies had any clue. Which was lucky as bulletin boards died out very quickly as more people got caught in the world wide web. At uni, I played my first ever LAN game, Quake, with around 12 of my mates there and I was soon dreaming about playing in massive online worlds with hundreds of people. I lived in the halls of residence and every Wednesday without fail, Myself and my neighbour Craig would sit down to watch reruns of Star Trek on his TV. And I began to dream past online gaming and of a future with holodecks. But I was aware that holodecks would be very far in the future. As also back in 1995, Toy Story, the world's first full-length computer animated movie, released to universal acclaim. In order to create the movie, Pixar first had to create their own renderer called Renderman which used the RAYS algorithm, which was designed to overcome the speed limitations of photorealistic algorithms like ray tracing, which were just far too computationally prohibitive at that time to be used. But even with the RAYS algorithm, rendering Toy Story took 117 computers running 24 hours a day, and single frames could take up to 30 hours to render. 30 hours for a single frame. And let's face it, we're pretty far removed from photorealism here. While gaming and computing in all its forms, in fact, was my first love, I also had another one in astronomy, which of course helped to fuel my love of Star Trek. I was still fairly young, in my early to mid-twenties when I finished at uni, and I had developed a real interest in extraterrestrial life, as somebody who looked at the sky so often would. And that may be something of a surprise to you today, given this Aliens Don't Exist video that I made. Like I said... I was still fairly young. Anyway, due to my interest in technology and aliens, in 1999, I learned of the SETI project and SETI at Home. SETI at Home was actually the third large-scale distributed computing project in existence, but it was the first that I was aware of. The first one was actually GIMPs, the great internet Mersenne Prime search, which many of you will recognise from the Prime95 software, which is very popular for benchmarking and stress-testing CPUs. And the second one was Distributed.net, though they are claiming to be the first general-purpose distributed computing project. And Distributed.net was a project to solve large-scale problems. With SETI at home, the data from the Arecibo telescope is divided up into work units and downloaded to users to analyse on their PC, with the results of the analysis being sent back over the internet. There's no payment for this, that's why it's called volunteer computing. But the idea of us being able to contribute in the search for alien life simply through the use of our PCs when they would otherwise be idle was just incredible to me. And I started wondering, where could this all go? Folding at home followed quickly towards the end of 2000. And now through the power of distributed computing, diseases were being cured. Again, voluntarily by people whose computers would otherwise be idle. 
It's important to realise, though, that back when all this was going on, there were very few graphics cards around. And whether you were playing Quake at uni, rendering movies at Pixar, finding prime numbers, folding proteins, or searching for ET, it was all done in software on the CPU. In the early to mid-2000s, my dream of playing in massive online worlds with hundreds of people was finally realised, with games such as Neverwinter Nights and World of Warcraft. Then, in 2006, the world's first feature-length path-traced movie, Monster House, was produced by Image Movers, who are perhaps better known for their 2004 hit, The Polar Express. They used the Arnold renderer, which for a long time was the only production-strength path-traced renderer. However, Arnold was fully CPU-based. It didn't use any GPU. As you can see, it's a big upgrade on Toy Story, as global illumination and ray-traced soft shadows really helped the characters in the environment. However, there was no motion blur or proper hair motion, as you can see. They called this helmet hair, and single frames still took multiple tens of hours to render. In the same year, the first generation of Folding at Home's GPU client, called GPU-1, was released to the public. And it delivered 20 to 30 times the speed up for some calculations over its CPU-based Gromax counterparts. It was the first time GPUs had been used for either distributed computing or major molecular dynamics calculations. And of course, wherever you find volunteer and not-for-profits utilising technology to their benefit, the corporations won't be far behind. Amazon launched their AWS, Amazon Web Services, in 2006 also. And we started hearing the word cloud a lot. Individuals, businesses and government could now rent Amazon's CPU and GPU hardware, creating, launching and terminating server instances as needed while paying by the second. And we could now have our hands on far more compute performance than would have been possible by building our own servers. Also in 2006, Pixar used a combination of the Rays algorithm that we saw with Toy Story and ray tracing in their famous movie Cars. Sounds familiar? It should, as this is where real time is today, with NVIDIA's hybrid approach of rasterized graphics combined with ray tracing elements, what they call RTX. The offline rendering industry was there in 2006. It just took hours to render single frames in their famous movie, Cars. By this point, Pixar had around 1,000 times the processing power they had during the making of Toy Story 11 years earlier. 3,000 computers with state-of-the-art processors, but single frames still took around 30 hours to render. And finally, in 2006, I was still watching Star Trek, reruns of Voyager and Deep Space Nine mostly, but holodecks seemed just as far away as they ever were. In 2009, a new type of currency arrived, cryptocurrency, called Bitcoin. To begin with, Bitcoins were mined in much the same way as folding at home using the power of the GPU. Bitcoins are sent from user to user via a peer-to-peer -peer network, removing the requirement for a central bank. Transactions are recorded in a blockchain, which is basically a ledger that records transactions between two parties, securely and permanently. Many new coins were spawned after Bitcoin and GPU miners were now making money, or cryptocurrency with the power of their graphics cards helping to secure the blockchain. SETI and Folding at Home were voluntary because they had to be, but the scientists, universities and health organisations might even have paid for that compute, had there been a method to do so. However, there was nothing at the time which feasibly allowed for large amounts of microtransactions worldwide. Most of those payments would have been eaten by the financial institutions, but blockchain enabled hundreds of thousands of individuals to receive small amounts of money, which is a major part of the reason why mining worked. Also in 2009, James Cameron's incredible visual effects movie, Avatar, hit cinemas, with the video effects unsurprisingly requiring an incredible amount of time and processing power. 10,000 square foot facility was used for the render farm, holding 4,000 HP servers, packed with 35,000 processor cores, 104 terabytes of RAM, and three petabytes of local storage. Of course, single frames still took several hours apiece to render though. Although the first gaming cloud was demonstrated way back in 2000, it was 2010 before anyone, on live, officially launched a service. Crytek actually began researching a cloud gaming system in 2005 for Crisis, 
but they halted development in 2007 because the cable infrastructure still wasn't really there in some countries. In a typical gaming cloud like OnLive, the company would purchase thousands of graphics cards and they would stream games on demand to users of the service. Each user would pay a monthly fee, somewhere between $10 and $30, which granted them on-demand access to a certain level of PC hardware in the cloud. So let's say back in 2010, $20 a month would get you access to a i7-920 maybe and a GTX 260. You would then choose to play a game through a thin client on your own PC or other device like a tablet. Your own hardware isn't that important except for your internet connection. And the client would take your inputs, then upload that data to the streaming service, which calculates the result of your actions on your virtualized 7 920 and GTX 260 PC for streaming the result back to you. There are some rather obvious issues with a platform like this. The most obvious being the latency involved in uploading your input to a remote PC, having your actions calculated and executed remotely before the result is sent back to you. That's a couple of hundred milliseconds right there. And what's more, streaming and compression artifacts are also an issue due to packet loss, which is why the good internet connection is a requirement. You might wonder why such an idea like cloud gaming even got off the ground given these issues. But as usual, the answer to those kinds of questions is simply money. Not everyone has a PC or can afford a decent gaming PC, so game streaming may be the only way they can play the latest games. With that said though, the requirement of a very good internet connection, especially back in 2010, that didn't come cheap either. So, like many others, I was left wondering who exactly was paying for this kind of service. Perhaps it makes more sense when you look at it from the perspective of a whole cloud. If there are 1,000 high-end graphics cards in a data center, those can be virtualized and used to provide almost any level of performance to any specific user. You could probably have up to 5,000 people play Minecraft on those GPUs, so long as it's not the ray traced version at least, at any one time. Furthermore, as people need sleep and generally don't game 24 hours per day, when one person drops out, another can join in. So the cards would be in constant usage rather than sitting idle. In a highly optimised game cloud, 1000 graphics cards could theoretically serve many more players, possibly even as many as 10,000 accounts. OnLive failed to gain any real traction though and only lasted two years before laying off all their employees in late 2012. I'll talk more about the economics of cloud hardware later. And finally, for 2012, Octane Render was released as the first commercially available unbiased ray tracer which fully utilised the GPU, running exclusively on NVIDIA's CUDA technology, and it had a clear significant speed advantage over the CPU renderers, allowing for modifying scenes in real time. 2013 was a hair-raising year for a couple of reasons. You remember Helmet here from Monster House? Well, realistic looking hair was also a problem in games and longer hair was often represented as a texture on a moving part of a skeleton, which led to a physically unrealistic hair movement. But in their 2013 smash hit Tomb Raider, Crystal Dynamics introduced AMD's Tress FX technology, and Lara was just that bit more realistic than most tunes of that year, depending on which part of her you were looking at. Tress FX was interesting in that previously, this level of hair detail was just too expensive to be used in games. But the performance of the technology was good, and graphics cards were growing in power, so high-end systems could handle it without too much of a performance hit. But as usual, when we see technology in gaming, the animation studios are far ahead visually. Monsters University proved this once again with the main character, Sully, having 5.5 million individual hairs. And on top of that, you'll also notice the blades of grass in the plaza, the swaying of the trees, the large number of student monsters roaming all over the school, and the lighting and shadows everywhere. Global illumination was now a requirement in animated movies by this point. And on top of all these extra technologies, meant that in terms of the render time, we were no further forward. The catch for all this eye candy? 100 million CPU hours were needed to render the final edit of the movie. It would take one CPU 10,000 years to render the 110 minute film at the rate of 29 hours per frame. Pixar however by this point had 2,000 computers with over 24,000 cores, a render farm which would have made the top 25 fastest supercomputers in the world at that time and they were able to render the entire movie in only two years. 
The image quality was never more realistic, but Holodex never fell any further away. By 2015, Bitcoin GPU miners found themselves completely outmatched by application-specific hardware, as corporations began to grab more and more of the currency for themselves. But luckily, a new blockchain had arrived, Ethereum. And this time the goal was not to replace central banks or PayPal, but to be a world computer, including a scripting language for development of applications. As with Bitcoins, Ethereum had a fundamental token called Ether which was used to pay for transactions. But Ethereum had multiple advantages over Bitcoin, including speed and ASIC resistance, which meant that the GPU miners had some safety net. Popularity of Ethereum exploded and it was soon the leading blockchain for new business startups, ICOs, with many use case proposals, though few that gained serious traction. Also in 2015, SETI at Home was finally using GPUs, but still failing to find any evidence of alien existence. While NVIDIA launched their own cloud gaming platform, GeForce Now Beta, on October that same year, just as Sony picked the bones of the dead on live, acquiring patents likely for use in their own PlayStation Now cloud service. 2016 was all about VR, with the Oculus Rift CV1 and the HTC Vive battling it out. It's safe to say that neither were winners, as the technology failed to ignite the imagination of the public at large. They finally felt that Holodex maybe weren't so far away. However, Renderman had now ditched the Rays algorithm and been rewritten as a path tracer. However, it still used the CPU for most of the work. Pixar released one movie in 2016, Finding Dory and every subsequent movie would now be fully path-traced. Of course, this meant once again, the need for more compute continued to rise unabated. When the animated movie Coco released in 2017, frames initially took a thousand hours to render due to the insane amount of lighting. After fixing some bugs, they got it down to 450 hours per frame, which was still clearly far too long, until eventually they got the final render time down to 50 hours per frame, after they implemented a few cheats. It was 2018 and the old ways were starting to look unviable. Renderman began to add more and more GPU functionality, as GPUs were clearly a superior choice to CPU in many tasks. But render times were now so prohibitive that multiple server farms were needed just to render out movies in under two years. Amazon, of course, had one answer to this. As you've seen in this video, a single shot like T-Rex bursting from the jungle can take days, weeks, or even years on a single computer. It's a resource-intensive process. And even as workstations and render farms have become significantly more advanced, so too have the rendering demands, as artists pack more detail into shots that must live up to higher visual standards such as 4K and HDR, and exceed audiences' expectations. And Amazon's answer was simple rendering on the cloud, their cloud, AWS. For the live action film Adrift, the video FX company Milk was challenged to deliver 170 fluid simulation shots to recreate an ocean, a job which was 10 times larger than anything the studio had attempted before. With AWS, they quickly scaled up from an average need of 80,000 CPU rendering cores to a peak of 132,000. And what's interesting here is, the monetary savings would be huge, as to complete a project like a draft using on-premises resources, their own servers basically, they would have needed 10 to 15 times more rendering nodes, but only some of the time. So, is Amazon and the cloud the answer to our insatiable needs for more compute? Maybe, but probably not. There are a few problems with hardware in the cloud. First, and likely the largest problem is Amazon having so much control? AWS is the clear leader in cloud services, and the company makes a fortune on it. Of course, continuing to make even more money will be Amazon's goal. So you can reasonably expect prices to rise as they claw back more of the user's savings for themselves. That's just business. And their business also requires significant outlay on hardware, the CPUs and GPUs that go in their clouds. With energy costs being such a huge factor in overhead, they save a lot more money with more efficient parts. What happens with all the old parts, I'm not entirely sure, but they likely just get tossed out. But regardless of that, Amazon has significant hardware costs to pay. 
and those costs will reflect in higher prices. Now, I've barely even mentioned AMD or NVIDIA in this video, but I will now. This is a constant source of frustration for me. As we saw recently with Google Stadia, they were using some Intel CPUs and AMD Vega GPUs. The AMD GPUs would have been chosen mostly due to price, and certainly not for power reasons, but also because Google's goals are more aligned with AMD's than NVIDIA's. The problem with the movie and FX industries is that, as you saw, initially all the rendering was done on CPU cores. That was fine for a long time. Now though, with path tracing being the norm, it makes a hell of a lot more sense to do that on GPUs instead. If you recall my Beyond Turing video where I showed how Otoy's Octane render can render path traced scenes interactively, like one or two frames per second. Now obviously these scenes shown are nothing like movie production quality. However, the point stands. GPU rendering is clearly vastly superior to CPU rendering in terms of speed. Old habits die really hard though, and the movie guys have been really slow to adopt GPU functionality as part of their scene production. As you heard, Render Man, even though it's basically a full path tracer today, still mostly uses CPU. Another renderer, Autodesk's Arnold, that finally began its trip down the GPU path last year, and will be completely rebuilt from the ground up for the GPU. The problem here though? Does it work with AMD? No. Over at Otoy and Octane Render. Scrolling down, I'd like to use Octane Render but I don't have an NVIDIA video card. Are OpenCL compatible cards, AMD and Intel GPUs, supported? Not yet. Octane Render requires a CUDA enabled NVIDIA video card to render. The work is ongoing to assimilate GPUs from AMD and Intel for future versions of Octane Render. Maxon's Redshift. Does Redshift support AMD GPUs on Windows or Linux? Redshift currently only supports CUDA compatible NVIDIA GPUs. Support for AMD GPUs is currently in development though. Like I said, a constant source of frustration. As the industry evolves to use more GPU, it is evolving firmly behind NVIDIA. And this isn't these guys' fault. It's the fault of AMD. One source telling me AMD's drivers have sucked for years. Look at the price of NVIDIA cards though. Why do you think RTX was created? RTX was all about the movie industry and the vast number of GPUs NVIDIA expects to sell to the cloud. Or better still, when you hold all the cards, literally, why not just run your own cloud? And if we don't want too much power in Amazon's hands, we probably don't want too much power in NVIDIA's hands either. But AMD, as usual, is lagging on software, leaving NVIDIA as the only viable choice. But maybe there's another answer. At the start of this video, I mentioned that I was contacted by two really cool guys from a company. As noted, the first video we collaborated on was Beyond Turing. However, the end goal was their project, Render. For full disclosure, please be aware that I was compensated for both videos. However, I believe it's best to consider it compensation for the amount of research I put into them. And to be frank, I didn't fully understand the need for a service like this until I started researching this video. Let me tell you how it works. I mentioned Octane Render as being the world's first and fastest GPU accelerated renderer, and we saw how the industry has slowly realised that, surprise, path tracing is better rendered on the GPU rather than CPU. Octane Render was built as a GPU path tracer from the start, and it should be in a very strong position now as the rest are playing catch up. Otoy could have been content to sell more Octane render licenses based on this. However, they had ideas going well beyond just that. And even if Amazon, Nvidia, or anyone else does begin buying a lot more GPU, they will still all have the issues regarding the constant need for upgrading, and possibly even worse than that. Amazon, Nvidia, these guys are always gonna be limited by data center real estate and pricing. There's only so much space for servers before you need even more space, which means higher costs for the end users. So how do you get around these issues? How about using technology that's been around for over 20 years? Distributed computing, similar to what we see with SETI and folding at home. Except now, instead of folding proteins or hunting aliens that don't exist, the GPUs, your GPU, is used to render frames whether those be frames from part of a blockbuster movie or a small animation company, or even an individual with a one-off scene that needs a bit more rendering power than they could reasonably afford to pay for. 
on AWS. Those frames are worth money and you can get paid for rendering them. So let's say you're an artist who has a scene needing rendered. You've got your basic scene configuration set up in Octane Render and then you send that to the render network, which calculates how many render tokens are required to perform the job based on stuff like the scene complexity, the duration, etc. Basically breaking it down to the amount of compute required. When you get the price back, you buy that amount of render tokens, which can be paid via Stripe or PayPal, and then send them through the Ethereum blockchain in the render network to a user who is willing to perform the work. A miner, basically. The render network receives a small commission between 0.5 and 5%, I believe, for facilitating the transaction and running the network. The miner completes a job which could be anything between hours and days, and when it's finished, the work is sent back to the artist with all the relevant transaction details being stored securely and forever on the blockchain, which is especially nice for digital rights management if you're a creator. There's some pretty cool interactions around this too. For example, you might be a dual user. You could be an artist who needs more performance when rendering final scenes, but you could also be a miner whose own cards could be used to render parts of other artist scenes when your card would otherwise be idle. This is so, so much more efficient than buying time on AWS. And the real beauty here is, the hardware costs are essentially nil. Because gamers and content creators will always be upgrading their graphics cards anyway, to game or to work. We are making that outlay for our main use case, which is gaming or work. Rendering frames for others is simply a way to recoup some money while the PC would otherwise be idle. Just like with crypto miners today, with one large difference. With the render network, you would actually be doing useful work with an end product that can be seen, unlike the massive waste of energy that is most crypto mining today. So how much would you as an artist expect to pay for this service? This 30 second render that you're looking at right now by Andrei Lebrov, who was the same artist who made the renders of the apples that you saw in my Beyond Turing video. Apparently, this finished overnight on the render network and it cost Andre 2300 to render. With each render token costing 25 cents, that's a total of $575. Now obviously, all values are subject to change, but it should be apparent that $575 for 30 seconds, multiply that by 180 for a 90 minute video, and you're basically at around $100,000 for a full length movie, which could be rendered today on the network in a matter of weeks. How much do you think it costs companies like Pixar for a 90 minute video taking two years to complete in their own render farms? A lot more than a hundred grand. As a miner, it is simply a case of starting the render client and if there's any free jobs needing done, there's a chance that you will be chosen to render some frames. I have currently completed 78 jobs over half a day on my 1080 Ti. And yes, you will need Nvidia GPUs. And I may do a deeper video on the entire process at some point. But this video is already very long, so head over to rendertoken.com if you want more details. The service just launched a couple of days ago alongside Octane Render 2020. Now, finally, on with the summary. Some of you might be wondering what this is all about. I've never really been one to talk about animation, and even in our latest podcast I said I barely even need the graphics power I have, as I'm only still playing Warcraft and even Baldur's Gate 2, which is 20 years old. But make no mistake about it, I still dream of holodecks, and I'm not the only one. In fact, Jules Urbach, Otoy and Render CEO, talks about them a lot as we can see over at Twitter and also in various interviews, and he is also in a position to make holodecks reality, or virtual reality. And they are serious about it, partnering with startup Lightfield Lab to build a pipeline for holographic content creation and display with the ultimate goal of enabling the Star Trek holodeck. But how? Where is all this compute performance coming from? Well, one way could be distributed computing, starting with the render network. And so I did a bit of research and I discovered that one inventor, Julian Michael Urbach, he's got one or two patents to his name and one of them this crowdsourced video rendering system talks about path traced rendering in real time from different viewports. That sounds a bit like a holodeck to me. If you recall from my Beyond Turing video, the part about samples per pixel, the really neat thing about path tracing is that the more samples you have, the better quality of the final image. So one person with a ray tracing capable GPU could render a two sample per pixel light map from their viewport 
while another renders a two sample per pixel image from theirs. And any of the pixels that overlap will be rendered at four samples per pixel. Recall the difference. And the beauty of this is, the more people you have, the better that either the speed or the quality is, due to the near perfect scaling of path tracing samples. Now you're probably thinking, the latency would kill this, but it needn't be the case. In the server client model that we see with game clouds today, like Stadia and GeForce Now, yes, the latency is a problem, because the server is far away, and it's doing the computation before sending the result back to the client. I read this recent paper called Dynamic Orchestration in Gaming, where edge company Edge Gap worked with Ubisoft to produce real data gathered in a live environment, and they managed to reduce latency to sub-50 milliseconds in 78% of their users' cases. Sub-50 milliseconds is perfectly acceptable to all except the most hardcore gamers. So there's no question that when done right, cloud or edge gaming can certainly be done viably and without being killed by lag. Getting back to the patent and reading through it, the method explicitly mentions users with powerful GPUs path tracing the scene from their viewport. So the client will be doing most of the heavy lifting, while the server just creates a composite of the viewport and sends it back. This method is for people with powerful PCs. Whereas the typical cloud gaming system is about providing some kind of AAA gaming experience to people with low-end hardware, this is something different. This is about using powerful PCs to provide a truly cutting-edge experience. And it was at this point that I truly started to believe that maybe, just maybe, we're closer to Holodex than I dared to dream. Otoi also have Brigade, which is their real-time rendering engine for video games. Again, it's fully path-traced GPU rendering, except now it's capable of real-time rendering at 60 frames per second on a single RTX 2080. It's pretty hard to believe how far we've come so quickly after NVIDIA launched RTX. But with ray tracing hardware becoming more common, soon we will all have the hardware capable of contributing. And thinking about this more, I realised just how close we are to it. Xbox Series X, PlayStation 5, complete with hardware ray tracing. That's a couple of hundred million GPUs on the level of a 2080 to 2080 Ti coming online over the next seven years, simply on the game consoles. Ray tracing is here, and it is not the gimmick that you thought it was with Turing. It's here, and nothing will ever be the same again. All those game consoles could be running render and making money for their owners while they're sleeping. But the software does need to be figured out first. And if you think that sounds like pure fantasy, let me tell you something. Holding at home ran on the PlayStation 3, making particular advantage of the console's much maligned cell processor. While hard to program for game developers, it turns out that it could run some calculations over 20 times the speed of a contemporary PC. And over its lifetime of 5 years and 7 months, more than 15 million users contributed over 100 million hours of computing to folding at home, which greatly assisted the project with disease research and led to the PlayStation 3 client lauded as a game changer for the platform. The next generation consoles could be a game changer for render and for gaming, if there's a will to make it happen. And if render does gain traction, ASICs could appear specifically for rendering graphics. Not for rasterization though, I'm talking real application specific path tracing hardware. The same thing happened with Bitcoin's ASICs after all, and if there's money in it, well, why not? As for me, I'm just happy to be playing a minor part in all this, and by bringing the technology to your attention, while hopefully serving up another fairly entertaining history to future video, I hope at the very least we'll have had you also dreaming of holodecks. I'll catch you later guys.